The video makes me feel like I'm in trouble. She is like looking into your soul and she knows everything you did wrong. Sweet cheese, tomatoes, cheese. Hello and welcome to the Untitled Gen X Podcast. A podcast hosted by two childhood best friends dedicated to the pop culture that raised us. I'm Kate, a writer, a midwife, a current day pop culture know nothing, but nobody puts baby in a corner when it comes to the pop culture of my youth. And I'm Lori, a writer and pop culture lover who's still not over how my so-called life left us hanging. Today, we're honoring British badass new wave duo, the Eurythmics, and their sophomore triumph 1983's Sweet Dreams are made of this. Who am I to disagree, Kate? We'll be recounting the childhood trauma of this music video while celebrating the sheer genius of the album itself. I have to tell you, the first time I saw this video for this song, I was in your bedroom. I don't know where you were, but I was there in your room alone in the dark. Okay, I I don't understand. But the (laughs) video came on and I was young enough to be really scared by this video because... Annie Lennox, like, she intimidated me in the same way that Cindy Lauper did. She was striking with her bright red hair and her bold makeup, and she just, like, stared into the camera with that piercing stare. And the song had a sense of, like, danger and confusion to it. Do you agree with me? So I'm going to tell you that I searched on YouTube for this video, and the picture that, like, the still... (laughs) I know what you're talking about. That goes with it is like that moment where she like, she's like sideways from the camera, like perpendicular to the camera. Yes. But she like turns her head and like looks directly into it. And I Even that image scared you. (laughs) Seriously, when I saw that picture, my heart did like a little like, ooh. (laughs) Yeah, it's like her eyes go right through you. They do. And so- here I am in your room in the dark and I was kind of freaking out because I was by myself and the song's like a little bit scary. Was it like in the middle of the night? Like you woke up? Yes. Yes. Like we fell asleep with the TV on. But I feel like you weren't there, but maybe you were just I think I was asleep because here's what I'm going to say about my first memory of this. And I think this might be the (laughs) same moment. (laughs) And we just were so traumatized that we like dissociated from the fact that we were together. (laughs) is that I can remember waking up in the middle of the night I'd fallen asleep with the tv on and you know how like the room's dark so the tv's really bright Um, this is my memory of it as well (laughs) and I just remember like it being like a close-up of her face (laughs) and she moves like it's like she moves her mouth so intentionally and then her eyes just keep staring at you (laughs) (laughs) Okay, well, I remember not being able to turn off your TV. I think it was because it was dark and I didn't know what button to press. And I was kind of panicked while this song is like, sweet dreams. (laughs) And it was, (laughs) it was scary. I mean, there's a lot of synth in this, right? But it wasn't like Juicy Fruit, synth poppy, like Aha's take on me. We're happy American young people. (laughs) Right, with sunshine in our hair. That is not what this was. (laughs) No. And so I remember having this moment of like sheer panic between the imagery of the video and the song itself and being startled and not being able to turn off your TV. That That's my trauma. I have a similar memory of when I woke up and it was on and like trying to like find the button, like, and I like couldn't find it quickly enough and it was terrifying and she was singing and (laughs) so weird, Katie, because it's like, we have the same memory, but neither one of us remembers each other being there. We felt very alone in our experience. And who knows, was it like, maybe it wasn't the same memory, but the other thing you have to keep in mind, uh, gentle listeners is that back in those days, you know, we didn't have MTV. So they played videos really late at night for some reason. So it's not like I set out to watch videos and fall asleep. Like I probably fell asleep to some other show and then this came on Uh and woke me up. Yeah, because your TV didn't have a sleep function. It wasn't that advanced. 
Right. Eventually. (laughs) Right. In watching the video, I had so many questions because as it turns out, I actually know a lot of the Eurythmics music, but I actually didn't know that the Eurythmics were two people. I thought they were a full band, I guess. And so when I set out to watch this video, I kept writing guy in my notes, guy, that guy has a name. His name is Dave Stewart. He is one of the two people with Annie He's apparently (laughs) suffering from the same problem as uh, who? Andrew Ridgely, the other guy from Wham. (laughs) He's the other guy from the Eurythmic. Well, not the other guy, but he's the guy from the Eurythmic. He's the guy. So I didn't actually even know that. But interestingly, Annie Lennox and Dave Stewart were in a band before the Eurythmics called The Tourists. Okay, wait, I'm sorry. Dave Stewart is the Andrew Ridgely of the Eurythmics? Yes, he is. Indeed. Okay. The Eurythmics is made of two people, okay. Annie Lennox and Dave Stewart. So they were in a band, like a larger band, called The Tourists that formed in 76. And they broke up in 1980. And while Annie and Dave were in Australia with the band that had just broken up, they decided... Maybe we could make weird and experimental electronic music. Congratulations. You had a vision and you achieved it. Okay. But again, sort of like aha, like their road to success was really pretty bumpy. Interestingly, though, on their flight home from Australia, they broke up as a couple. They had dated for like three years. That's intense. There was a lot of breaking up going on around this Australia trip. But they still went on to make beautiful music together for years and years to come. So... I admire people who can do that. I end up friends with most of the men that I've dated, but there's always a period where I have to be like, okay, we're going to go away from each other for a little while. Yeah. And I mean, it's not like you're in a band where you're basically married to each other. Like look at Fleetwood Mac. That's the stuff of legend. Right. So I uh, once in my very young adulthood dated someone that I worked with and I will never make that mistake again. (laughs) Girl, you do not dip your pen in the company ink. Yeah, it was bad. I was a waitress. He was a cook. I had to be really mindful of like what ended up on my plates if things were not going well between us. Oh, wow. Mm -hmm. Annie Lennox had said, We wanted control over what we were doing rather than a team of people coming in and telling us what they thought we should be doing. And so the two of them decided we're going to like create this little makeshift studio. We want to record our own music. We want to do it our own way. And they had really rudimentary equipment and they were just experimenting and trying new things. And ultimately, this is how they created Sweet Dreams. They created this on an eight track. Wow. It was actually a very depressing time. Dave Stewart said, Annie was curled up on the floor in the fetal position when I managed to produce this beat and riff. She suddenly went, what the hell is that? Leapt up and started playing the other synthesizer. Between the two dueling synths, we had the beginnings of Sweet Dreams. It was a juggernaut rhythm, but it wasn't a song. Quickly, Annie did this startling rant, which began, sweet dreams are made of this, and it was mind-blowing, but depressing. So I suggested the hold your head up, moving on bit to make it more uplifting. And Annie said, quote, sweet dreams are made of this is basically me saying, look at the state of us. How can it get worse? I was feeling very vulnerable. The song was an expression of how I felt, hopeless and nihilistic. Wow. But look what came out of it, like in their darkest time. Right, the darkness before the dawn of darkness. (laughs) Dave Stewart described the Sweet Dreams ethos as, quote, cold, European, hard, tough-sounding synthesizers with a soulful voice. I had decided to put the guitar down and try something I didn't know how to play. Keyboards were completely alien to me, and I thought something new would come out of it through that. And it did. The song is like everywhere. It's everything. It was everywhere. It was released January 4th, 1983. It reached number one in the U.S. Billboard charts. And this album had four singles. This is the house, the walk, love is a stranger, which we'll touch on. And of course, sweet dreams. They were nominated for a Grammy in 1984 for (laughs) 
best new artist, but guess who they lost to? That was a rough year for them to have been nominated because they were (laughs) up against someone who, while different in terms of like the energy of her music, very similar in terms of the sort of innovation of what was going on. And so Cindy Lauper. Cindy Lauper took the prize. She took the Grammy that year. That was some tough competition for them. It absolutely was. But my feelings towards Annie Lennox were very similar to my feelings towards Cindy Lauper. See, that's interesting because my feelings towards Annie Lennox very much fit like your description of that song, right? About it being like cold and um, harsh. And uh, whereas like Cindy Lauper, I was like, wow, I'm super intimidated by her. And she's a little bit weird, but I like her. She Bob didn't frighten me the way this song frightened me. The video though was uncomfortable for me. Oh, She Bop is totally weird. And I also literally didn't know until like halfway through <laughs> it as an adult that it was about masturbation. But there you go. We encourage you to go back and listen to that episode, episode 11. Yeah, we tackle Cindy Lauper. She's so unusual. Yes, it's a good one. So, what's funny about going back to watch this video of Sweet Dreams as a grown up is that <laughs> I'm sure that I must have seen this whole video. I don't know though. Now I'm like, maybe I didn't, maybe anytime. I think, I think it's quite possible that anytime it came on that I changed the channel because I I disliked it and found it that disturbing. So I don't know if I ever watched it all the way through, but if I did, I blocked it out of my mind because watching this, I was like, what is going on? Well, you know, it's interesting because there's elements of the video that are really, it's sort of like an s and Right, where she says like the, some of them want to abuse you and she has a little right. prop in her hand. And then the next line is some of them want to be abused. And she kind of does this funny little thing with her eyes, like this suggestive little wink. It's funny that you say that because she said, because of lines like, some of them want to use you, some of them want to be abused, people think it's about sex or s and and it's not about that at all. Was she talking about like the music industry? Well, the video is very much about the music industry. I mean, you saw the gold records on the wall in the boardroom. Right. I would say, yes, perhaps when she wrote it, that was not her intention and that's not how she but I mean the way they present it does definitely play off of that but I will say like so many videos from the 80s when you watch them like the quality of them doesn't really hold up Mm -hmm. they look old they look dated this one actually didn't like this one if you told me this was like a new duo that came out with this song I would be like that's a new video so I feel like that's quite an accomplishment in an era that often looks very dated. I would even argue that Love is a Stranger looks more dated. I actually think that video came out first, but obviously these are both in relation to this album. While I found Sweet Dreams so disturbing as a kid, I, I go back and I watch it now, and there's nothing really scary about it per se. I still found it quite disturbing. Did you? The eyeball. Yeah, that was kind of weird. There were so many eyeballs. There were a lot of eyeballs. I don't like close-ups on eyeballs. Yeah, that's that's not a thing. I don't like it. Okay, so the video. It was directed by Dean Carr and Chris Ashbrook. According to ClassicPopMagazine.com, it was inspired by Salvador Dali and underground cinema. Yeah, I do feel like they hit the mark on like everything they set out to do. Well, Dave Stewart said, quote, we approached making videos in a surrealistic filmmaker's way, and that was what broke America for us. MTV had just started and all these videos would be on. Then Sweet Dreams would come on with me and Annie with a cow. There'd be some farmer in Texas watching, thinking, what the hell is going on here? And we really benefited from all that because it was really unusual for the time. It was unusual for the time. It's unusual for now. Right, right. Let's talk about this video. We need to break this down. It opens strong, right? It opens so strong. There's a dark boardroom. We see a globe and some gold records on the wall. But wait, am I remembering this right? That before we even see any of that, we see the table in the boardroom and right on the beat, 
like the first beat a fist pounds on the table. That's entirely possible. I don't recall. <laughs> yeah, no, it's it's a really cool effect. The song comes on and I don't know if it's the first beat, but it's one of the early beats and it just perfectly in time dun, like dun, 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 hits dun, dun, on the dun, dun, table and then it comes up and we see the globe and the records on the wall and everything. Yes. Okay, so we see like a screen with footage of a rocket shooting into space and there is Queen Annie Lennox. Let's talk about how Annie's dressed. She's dressed in a black double-breasted suit and tie. She has buzzed red hair and dark eye makeup. And red lips. A very bold lip. She looks aggressive. She looks fierce, like you're not going to screw with her. She also has, what is that in her hand? Some kind of crop that she like. You said crop. I think it's actually a presentation pointer. Is it? I think so. I was like, that looks part magician wand, part S&M crop. Right. I, because I guess because she used it that way, that's what I thought. But she is in a boardroom. I right. could be sexualizing something <laughs> non sexual. Sorry. No, guys. I, I think it was supposed to look like that. Yeah. She almost looks like a dominatrix. Right. It has that vibe. And she's wearing leather gloves. Right. Annie Lennox said, quote, I felt that by wearing a man's suit, standing beside Dave and cutting my hair in a in an aggressive way, that I was making a statement about being equal to a man. I didn't want to be perceived as a sex object. There was more to me than that. I wanted to take the old cliche tradition of female singers being sexy and pretty in a dress, passive and submissive, and do something with it. BBC said, quote, all eyes were on Annie Lennox, the singer whose powerful androgynous look defied the male gaze. It was striking. It was striking. And, you know, as a kid, I did not know what to do with that. Like, I had never seen a woman that looked like that. But then as an adult, going back and looking at it and having obviously seen a much wider spectrum of people throughout my life, right? I was struck by how delicate her features actually are. Yes! She's so beautiful. Kate... The symmetry of her face, her yeah. bone structure, she is beautiful. Yeah, it was it was so interesting because I was like, oh, I never saw this when I was a kid. I saw the red hair and the dark eye makeup and the red lips and the scary song uh, and the piercing eyes. But then I just, as I was watching this, I was like, oh, she's actually, I mean, I'm not saying that you can't be lovely with all of those other qualities, but those aren't particularly delicate qualities. No. (laughs) And and I mean, she's presented in such a harsh manner. Right. The really harsh lighting. Right. Like very like moody. Right above you. Yeah. It just lends itself to this feeling of just being uncomfortable or on the spot or almost like you're being interrogated. The video makes me feel like I'm guilty of something. The video makes me feel like I'm in trouble. Well, I was going to say it definitely like breaks fourth wall, right? So like in in theater, there's this idea that like you maintain your fourth wall. So you're in your own world and the audience is in another world and the two don't interact. And if you break fourth wall, it means that you're like acknowledging the audience. And sometimes that's a technique that's used theatrically. So when she like looks straight in the camera, she is like looking into your soul and she knows everything you did wrong. (laughs) She does. And your immediate reaction or my immediate reaction is, oh shit. Like I'm in trouble. I'm about to be punished. I'm going to admit to something I didn't even do just to get out of this situation. Yes. She's a little like robotic in the beginning. And then that softens a little as things go on. But you know what it reminded me of? What? That really weird part of Beaches Oh, me too. Me yeah. Too. Yes. <laughs> oh, industry, whatever will become. Yeah. No, me too. I totally had that same yeah. thought. <laughs> it's weird to share a childhood with someone. It like is. as close as we were, we, ha- I don't know. It is. It's weird to share a childhood with somebody who's like not your actual sibling, right? Yeah. Like we're probably like as close as people could have been and not have been siblings. Yeah. It, it's super weird because that's exactly the thought I had too. Because she sort of like tilts to the side at one point and like it just has this robotic like 
beaches industry. Totally. We pan out from Annie and we see Dave Stewart working on a computer with this like teeny tiny screen and a, a weird keyboard and it's playing footage of Annie. We're like, okay, what's going on here? Then Annie and Dave sit cross-legged in meditation on the conference room table. They're like holding hands and all of a sudden we get a close-up of Annie's face, her beautiful, beautiful work of art bone structure. And we zoom into her bindi, which becomes a very surprise special effect, (laughs) right? Like we zoom in on the bindi and then, oh my God, it's not a bindi anymore. It's actually a sniper scope. Like at first it just looks like you're seeing like this little pocket into this world and then it gets the crosshairs in it of the sniper scope and you're like, oh, what? The sniper scope is targeting Annie and Dave and they're in a rowboat on the water and Andy is standing and saluting and it feels scary and serious. Yeah. Who is she saluting? Why are they there? How far are we from the boardroom? Yeah. Suddenly we see a woman with like big 80s hair and bright red lips. She's wearing a red evening gown and a pearl studded eye mask. And she's playing the cello. And then we see Dave wearing an eye mask and he's also playing the cello. Well, and earlier in the boardroom, when he's on the computer, Uh one of the things that flashes and you can't tell in that scene, because all I wrote down in my notes, I was like, eyeball squiggly lines because you see like this eyeball where and then it like turns to the side so all you can see is the bulgy veiny white part of the eyeball yes do not like eyeballs and then it has these squiggly lines around it yes and then you realize what you were actually looking at was a close-up of this eye mask with squiggly lines and then like the opening for where you could see the eyes yeah Then all of a sudden, as one does, Dave Stewart is in a field with his cello spinning around in slow motion, playing the cello. Frolicking in the hay. (laughs) It's laughing. (laughs) And there's cows. There's close-ups of cow eyeballs as well. Lots of eyeballs. So then we cut back to the conference room, and there's a cow in there because. And Annie and Dave are now back in the conference room, laying on the conference table in the dark and singing while the cow roams around. Now, I've spent many, many hours of my work life in a conference room. Not one time has there been livestock in there. No, and I have spent much time around cows because (laughs) I used to live in Wisconsin and not once did I see one go into a conference room. (laughs) So I guess what we're trying to say is this is unusual. So the cow's in the conference room and Dave's like trying to work on that funky computer and the cow's like in the way and Annie pounds on the conference table with her fist emphatically. And as she sings, there's like video footage of cows behind her. And then we see Annie and Dave walking in a field with more cows. Then they're in a rowboat and she's sitting and salutes and he plays the cello. And then at the very end of the video, we cut to Annie laying in bed and on her nightstand is a book with a picture of she and Stuart. And the book is titled Sweet Dreams Are Made of This. Now about the cows, Dave Stewart told The Guardian, people went bonkers for the video, which was constantly on MTV. I wanted to make a commentary on the music business, but also make something a bit performance art weird and dreamlike. So we mocked up a record company boardroom in a studio and we put a cow in it to signify reality. There we were, Annie and I laid flat on a table and this cow, which was peeing everywhere. Because cows are not house trained. They're not boardroom trained. (laughs) When a cow pees, it's a lot of pee. I bet it's a lot of pee. (laughs) No cows were harmed in the making of this podcast. Thankfully, no. The video was in heavy rotation. I mean, I remember seeing it a lot after that first traumatic experience. And it won an MTV VMA. They won for Best New Artist. Annie said, quote, I decided I was prepared to go far with the exploration of persona and performance and music and see where that would go. I was prepared to go all the way with it, pushing it because I felt I had nothing to lose. Absolutely. A fearless look. It's a fearless video. I mean, if the cow represents reality, I was thinking the cow represented like the masses, the herd. 
Right. Like following, right? Like that's kind of what I got from that. But yeah, reality is good too, because there are a few things more real than a cow. (laughs) Hey, in terms of the song itself, Annie said, people think I'm singing sweet dreams are made of cheese. Oh, sweet dreams are made of these. On the YouTube video, I was reading the comments and somebody wrote, when I was younger, I thought it said, sweet cheese, tomatoes, (laughs) cheese. So the video has over half a billion views on YouTube. And some of the greatest YouTube comments that I saw were, she was ahead of her time and she's even ahead of ours. So this is what I was thinking of when you were talking about, you know, it being performance art and all of this stuff. And I thought, well, I was, what, seven or eight when this video was popular. And I did not come from artsy folk at all. Uh, So that was beyond me. But I was wondering, people who were older and maybe into artsy stuff, did they recognize it for that at the time? Or was it even beyond them? I don't know. I don't know because someone else said in the YouTube comments, the day I understand this video is the last day of the world. <laughs> right. It's so weird, but like it is enjoyable now. I mean, it still causes my heart to like skip a beat a little bit because it, it does scare me. As familiar as this song is, it still does that. That anxiety. <laughs> it's all coming back to me. Someone else said in the YouTube comments, God, it feels like I'm having a fever dream watching this video. Right. Marilyn Manson covered this song in 1999, if you remember. Oh, yeah. And I mean, okay, Marilyn Manson, we can, deeply problematic, but. Didn't age so well there. No. Billboard named his video for that song as the scariest video ever. Right. I mean, because how could it not be? Yeah, I didn't go back and watch his video because I remember seeing it, you know, back in 99. And I I know his cover of this song and it scares me. And so I didn't want to go and relive that. Like it was enough to watch this video again. So here's a thought. What if the whole thing is a fever dream? What if we're still asleep in my bedroom? No, don't do that. I can't turn off the damn TV. (laughs) What if we just dreamed everything that's happened in the last, like, 30-some years? Like a bad episode of Dallas. (laughs) For a song this old, I always want to know what brings people back to the song. Is it their memory Mm -hmm. of it? Why is the younger generation here? That's what I'm particularly interested in. Right. That is interesting. Yeah. So apparently, Sweet Dreams was used in X-Men's 2016 X-Men Apocalypse film. And it's the famous Quicksilver scene. I haven't seen this movie, but a lot of people came because they liked the song from that scene. So it's always interesting to know in terms of like legacy. It shows up in a movie, shows up in a TV show. Yes. So there's another video for the song Love is a Stranger. The first release of Love is a Stranger didn't perform well, but after the success of Sweet Dreams, they re-released it and it reached number 23 on the Billboard Top 100. So sometimes, hey, let's try it again. Let's re-release it after we have some steam from something else. And so the video was directed by Mike Brady. Basically, in the video, we see Annie in the role of like a high-class prostitute. And she's wearing fur and a blonde curly wig. She looks beautiful and feminine. And she's picked up by a car chauffeured by Dave Stewart, the other guy in the arrhythmics, (laughs) Dave Stewart. So she's singing into the camera and she pulls off her blonde wig to reveal slicked back red hair. Apparently, it was super controversial that she did this back in the day. People were like, is she transgender? What does it mean? And of course, throughout this video, we see her in a hotel. Now she's dressed in all leather. She's got a black wig on. She's very feminine. And so that, I believe, is to signify her dressing up in sort of like, like in reference to sexual subculture and like fetishes. Mm Mm-hmm. She takes off that black wig and she's got slicked back hair again. And then at the end of the video, we see her in a man's suit with the slicked back hair. And she's wearing, I believe, aviator sunglasses. And she is moving very robotically. She moves like a robot. 
It's very strange. But, you know, again, it's sort of like with Sweet Dreams, the gender bending of it all back in the early 80s. I mean, it's not something that was necessarily new. You know, we had artists like David Bowie, for example. Boy George. Boy George. We had artists who were doing these things, but it doesn't mean that it still wasn't shocking for mainstream America. Well, were women doing it? Well, that's actually a really good question. She's right. Like women in pop music in the 80s were very feminine and girly. And that was kind of the whole purpose behind the Sweet Dreams video is to say, I don't want to do that. That's not my persona. There's more to me than that. You're going to see me in this way. I deserve a seat at the table. I deserve to stand next to Dave Stewart as an equal, as an artist. Right. It's an interesting concept in terms of feminism is that do women have to become like men to have a seat at the table? Or can women really highlight what they bring to the table and be taken seriously? Not in the 80s, I'll tell you that. I was going to say that's a really big question. And I think it's multifaceted because we're talking about the early 80s. This is 1983. And not only that, we're talking about the music industry. So both of those things exclusively present challenges. But together, I think that that was probably a very difficult situation. I read that they were experimenting with musical instruments. They were experimenting with cows. (laughs) Cows. Not like that. (laughs) <laughs> with new oh god with new technology it was just a very experimental time and so this is what came out of it you could even argue that it's experimental sounding to this day it still sounds really new right like it should be in some futuristic dystopian gattaca yeah it has that sound to it yeah like while propaganda films are playing <laughs> or something <laughs> <laughs> i totally agree with that That kind of goes back to Dave Stewart saying that the ethos of this song is cold, European, hard, and tough sounding, because that's exactly what it is. Right. But but there is that sort of uh, genre of like European sort of industrial music, right? So it's like early EDM before EDM. Right. I I encourage people, if you have not seen this since you were terrified by it as a child, to go back and look at it. It it really is interesting. It's still perplexing and at moments terrifying. I would love to know everyone's first experience with this video because I actually believe people probably have them. Was it like mine and Lori's where you (laughs) awoken in the middle of the night and couldn't get it off your screen fast enough? But as for Annie and Dave today... Dave Stewart told MrFeelGood.com, Annie and I are the best of friends, and it has been 40 years. We talk just like every other day, and we laugh and joke about things as well. We talk about things that happened in retrospect, things that were like a nightmare, but we can laugh about them. Oh, that warms my heart. Yeah, me too. The Arrhythmics broke up, I believe, in 1990, and Annie Lennox went on to have a very successful solo career. If you remember her 1992 album, Diva, this was the album that had the song Why and Walking on Broken Glass. Mm, Huge hits. She had more solo albums follow, but what she's really focused on is political and humanitarian work and activism for global feminism. I like it. She's very philanthropic and she has been married three times and has two daughters. Now, as for Dave Stewart, he's been married three times and this is interesting. His first wife was Siobhan Fahey. I don't know if I'm pronouncing that correctly. Of Bananarama. Really? Yes. Such a small musical world. I know. He has four daughters, and he's released albums as a solo artist and with the Spiritual Cowboys. And according to the Arrhythmics website, he's written for and produced Tom Petty, Shakespeare's sister, and Mick Jagger. He directed the film Honest and co-wrote Ghost the Musical. And if you're really a fan of the Arrhythmics, he published an autobiography called Sweet Dreams Are Made of This, A Life in Music. Nice. The Arrhythmics will be inducted officially into the 51st Annual Songwriters Hall of Fame in June 2021. They were supposed to be inducted last year, but the ceremony had to be postponed because of one global pandemic. I know. Do you think that it's going to be virtual? Yeah, probably. 
but at least they'll get their official induction because they belong there. I know. I mean, I'm hoping there might be people involved, even if they're outside and masked. Outside masked people are better than no people. It's true. It's true. Thanks so much for joining us. We want to remind you to rate and subscribe so you never miss an episode, because next week we're covering Ronald Miller's epic glow up in Can't Buy Me Love. Oh, best glow up ever. And this was like so long before McDreamy. Like we were early adopters. He is still so fine today. So come back next week. And just a friendly reminder, you can find us online at the untitled Gen X podcast.com. We hope you keep in touch, beautiful people. Bye. Bye.